By the mid-1990s, fighting games quickly rose to be the most popular genre of video games. It seemed every month a new machine was showing up at the local arcade, and developers were trying to outdo each other for who could come up with the most enticing concept. From the hyper-fast combat in Street Fighter 2, the bloody realism of Mortal Kombat, to the 3D rendered characters in Tekken. New ideas were cropping up left and right, and it was exciting to see what would come next. In August of 1994, Atari games were released to arcades, quite possibly the most original idea up to that point in the genre, with Primal Rage. A 2D fighter where the characters were digitized puppet models of dinosaurs and other prehistoric creatures trying to assert world dominance through conquest. <laughs> Development cycles being what they were, it's no doubt that both games were being worked on simultaneously, so it's unfair to say one begat the idea for the other. But shortly after Primal Rage made its debut, home consoles saw the release of Brutal Pause of Fury in December of 1994, both developed and published by GameTech, the same guys who brought us several Jeopardy games, as well as Zool. Brutal Pauls of Fury is a 2D sprite-based fighting game where the characters are various animals coming together in a martial arts tournament where the final opponent is the Dalai Lama. The story is almost a carbon copy of the Mortal Kombat story, minus the soul-sucking and fatalities. The characters cover many different species from a grizzly bear to a lion, a rat, a leopard, a rabbit, among a few others. For the Sega CD port, we are of course greeted with the obligatory FMV cutscene, and that sets up the story and then it's off to the main screen to choose a fighter and get started. For this review, I want to be a little bit more critical than usual because the idea for this title was one of the better ideas, but the execution is somewhat middling. For the good, the backgrounds are very nicely rendered and colorful, and the sprites are very lively and well animated. Much like the SNK fighters of its time, the best way to experience this game was with a six button controller because there are six different attack face buttons to use. The game is very fast paced and very entertaining to a degree. But all that is juxtaposed with the most asinine mechanic that I can think of in a fighting game to date. In order for you, the player, to execute special moves, you must wait until your character's sprite learns the moves in the game. You can spam the move on your controller all day long, but until it's actually unlocked, nothing will happen. For an RPG, I can understand this mechanic, but for a fighting game, it's just very off-putting. Imagine playing Street Fighter, and you can't do a Hadouken until you beat four enemies. You can't do a Shoryuken until you've beaten eight characters. It's just very baffling game design. And even more annoying is the first move that you will learn is a taunt, which is a special stance that you can take and regain a little bit of health. It's not until four enemies have been felled that you can learn your first offensive special move, which makes the game very slow moving because the first several bouts consist of you mashing various face buttons because you can't do any of the special moves until later on. As I said, I can understand it from a depth standpoint because it makes it to where you need to really dig in with multiple playthroughs using your login name to get the most out of the game. But to just pick up and play, you're introduced with a very bland and two-dimensional combat style that can't be fixed initially. The game has about nine different difficulty levels as well, and unless you have it on the lowest level, it's a very hard and long grind to even get anywhere. To say the least, the game can become exceedingly difficult with minimal effort. Weird game designs aside, Something that was greatly executed was the soundtrack. Composed by Doug Brandon, with assistance from Robin Heifetz, most of the tracks are very high-driving techno hits, and some with a bit of an eastern flair to them.
Initially, I was thinking some of these tracks are being executed by the FM sound chip because of how dirty some of the drums sound, but after inspecting a disc in the audio player, no, that's just Redbook Audio. As said previously, the sprites are all beautifully rendered and animated, thanks to Andy Gilmore, Dave Hall, and Juan Sanchez. According to Gordon Fong, who worked on the Amiga port, each Sega platform character had its own 16 color palette, as well as up to 128 discrete frames of animation, which was what allowed each character to have such fluid movement. In addition to the sprites, the backgrounds are also all nicely designed and colored as well. I would have liked to have seen some parallax scrolling, but I'm sure it was just a lack of memory considering the sprite allocation. But there were at least animated pieces in most arenas like background water or other things of that sort. And you can even knock opponents off the platform at Leon stage for an instant win. Similar to how NBA Jam went to NBA Jam Tournament Edition, Game Tech released a quasi-sequel exclusively on the Sega Genesis 32X in the US market as Brutal Above the Claw. This game is obscenely difficult. Starting on easy, I can't even get past the first opponent here. So for this video, I set a two-player game against a Megafire controller for the rest of this footage. I didn't experiment around with it because I was so annoyed, but I'm almost wondering if, again like NBA Jam TE's port on the Saturn, if they got the difficulty modes mixed up, whereas easy is actually extra hard. That's the only thing I can assume. Be that as it may, I was very surprised at how the 32X almost nailed the Sega CD soundtrack. <laughs> Even without Redbook Audio, the 32X can apparently produce some outstanding music when given the chance. The backgrounds are reimagined to be more detailed and more colorful in the 32X, but still lack parallax scrolling unfortunately. All that to say, the game is beautiful visually and has some great moments with music, but unfortunately the fighting gameplay is just average at best. And add the fact that you can't execute special moves until your character learns them in the game can be a very slow and painful start to an already mediocre fighting game. For 32X, they had the opportunity to refine some of these shortcomings and really deliver a great showpiece title since it was an exclusive. But unfortunately, it was more of the same, just exceptionally more difficult, which left you puzzled on why you even got it in the first place. At least Primal Rage is on 32X, so that's always an option.